course, can I thank you all for coming today? And hopefully I won't disappoint in what we've got to say. I'm Lindsay Hoyle. I'm a member of Parliament for the Labour Party and a member of Parliament for Chorley, which is up in Lancashire. Um, I'm a North West MP, as you can tell from my accent. I was born and brought up in my constituency. I'm one of the few MPs who can claim that they represent the constituency they're born and brought up in. And of course, I've got to just tell you, I represent the best constituency in the UK. I'm totally biased. What I would say is, in 2010, I was elected by the whole House to the post of Chairman of Ways and Means. It's the first time that the post has actually been appointed through an election. I would like to, of course, thank the Outreach team uh, for inviting me to speak on the topic of Ways and Means. An awful lot is written and said about the powers of the Speaker, but it's not often that the role of Chairman of Ways and Means is discussed in length. Let's see if I can address some of that this morning. Of course, I head up to the big day for Chairman of Ways and Means, and that is that the Chancellor of the Exchequer will come to Parliament to deliver his budget statement. The Speaker chairs the big events. I've got to be honest, the parliamentary calendar, it is normally the Speaker. The most high profile of statements by government ministers usually is done by the Speaker. But the budget is a very different, and unlike all other grand parliamentary occasions, it will not be the Speaker who takes the chair of the budget, it will be the Chairman of Ways and Means. This has been the case for centuries. It is one of the things I would like to do today, is explain to you why this is the case. And in order to answer the questions, we have to go back in history. The existence of Chairman of Ways and Means all stems from a very different position of the Speaker in the 16th and 17th centuries. The situation then was different than it is today. Now the Speaker is elected from the House by the House and he is expected to represent the interests of Parliament. But in the early centuries the Speaker was a very, very different creature. Although the Speaker was elected by the House, in practice, the Crown was able to ensure that its preferred candidate was elected. The Speaker acted as a link between Parliament and the King, with information and duties flowing in both directions. While the Speaker would represent the House's interest to the King, he was also expected to represent the King's interest to the House. This conflicting role left the Speaker in a difficult and precarious position. Far from being trusted by the House, he was viewed with considerable suspicion. Many saw him as a spy for the king and an agent for the crown. This led to be wary of the speaker's involvement in the house's consideration of what is known as ways and means. Here, I must digress a little to explain the terms of ways and means. Erskine May defines it as a provision of revenue to meet national expenditure. In other words, it is the ways and the means of supplying the money needed to keep the country going or to finance a new policy. And it is always that that refers to new taxes, changes to taxes, and often forgotten, but equally important, the handing out by the Exchequer of the money raised through those taxes. You can see why, at a time of simmering mistrust between Parliament and the Sovereign, the House might be reluctant to have the King's man cheering debates on this most sensitive of subjects, which would determine the amount of money available to the King. Because the view was, the King's coffers grew and the Speaker never left office without a good bank account. So on and off from the mid-17th century and then formally in 1689, the House resolved whenever it would come to consider the ways and means. The House would turn itself into a committee, a committee of the whole House to be chaired by one of its own rather than the Speaker. For those who don't know, a committee of the whole House is when the House chooses to meet in the form of a single large committee. The mace is removed from its usual position. As you ever look at the table, the mace is there. It's actually put to a lower position. So if a member comes in, they're always able to recognise 
whether it's the House that is sitting or whether it is the House that is in committee. And the meeting is not chaired from the Speaker's chair, but from the lower chair, the clerk's table. The, the meeting still hold, held in the chamber, and any member of the House can attend, speak and vote. So everybody is involved. So this was a neat way and a neat solution of excluding the Speaker while including all members of the House. The arrangements for the Committee of Ways and Means were formalised in 1689, following the so-called Glorious Revolution, which saw the overthrow of James II, the installation to the throne of William and Mary, and the declaration of the famous Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights of 1689 set out the rights of Parliament and prohibited the royal interference and insisted that agreement of Parliament was necessary for the implementation of any taxes. So you can see that the permanent establishment of the Committee of Ways and Means fitted neatly into those principles. The first permanent chairman of the Committee of Ways and Means was appointed in the same year. He was a Whig politician named Richard Hampton. He was chairman of Ways and Means, and he also chaired its sister committee, the Committee of Supply. And as you can see from the chart, that is where he's first named. Whilst the Ways and Means Committee considered how it had to raise money and what should be released for spending, the Committee of Supply considered how much should be spent and on what. The suspicion of the Speaker's role petered out in the 19th century. But the Committee of Ways and Means remained in place until 1967. And until that time, the Committee was the forum for the Chancellor's annual budget statement setting out the state of the public finances and the plans for taxation for the year. As well as making an oral statement, the Chancellor would move to a series of resolutions and to be considered and voted on by the committee and would which then become the finance bill. This is the bill that is required to give full permanent effect to the budget resolutions. So all of the budget statement and the debate that follows take place in the Ways and Means Committee under the watchful eye, not of the Speaker, but of the Chairman of Ways and Means. But all good things must come to an end and the Ways and Means Committee and the Committee of Supply, as I say, was abolished in 1967, following moves to simplify the financial procedures of the House. It was no longer necessary to maintain these structures of separate committees that had earlier for centuries been so important in checking the powers of government and that of the Sovereign. By 1967, as we know, the relationship between the Crown and Parliament was different and the House was able to abandon and modify many of its ancient financial procedures, such as the separate Committee of Ways and Means and Supply. But all the procedures changed the House. The House retained its fundamental right to grant, or indeed to refuse to grant, the money required by the Executive. Since 1967, the debate that used to happen in the Committees of Ways and Means now takes place on the floor of the House. Although the committee was abolished, the heritage of the post of Chairman of Ways and Means, along with many additional duties that had become attached to it over the years, ensured that the post of Chairman of Ways and Means survives, hence I'm here today. And although the budget statement and the debate no longer takes place in special committee of Ways and Means, it remains the convention that the Chairman of Ways and Means takes the chair for the most exciting of parliamentary occasions. Now many of you will know me best as Deputy Speaker, but the Chairman of Ways and Means has not always been a Deputy Speaker. In fact, the post of Chairman of Ways and Means existed separately for over 150 years before it merged with that of the Deputy Speaker. So how did the Chairman of Ways and Means come to take on this role? Well, before 1855, there was no provision for a regular Deputy Speaker. The absence of the Speaker was more than just a slight inconvenience. It had a real impact on the House. If the Speaker was unaffordably absent, no business could be taken. In fact, the Clerk of the House would then put the question for the adjournment, and the day's session would end without even starting. 
No business was dealt with, no debates were held, and no questions were decided. And if the Speaker was unable to attend for a long period of time because of illness, the theory, which was often explained but never actually tested, was that another Speaker would have to be elected in his place, who would then discreetly stand down if and when the other Speaker recovered. Well, as we know, MPs don't like giving up power too easily. So coping with only spe one Speaker wasn't such a problem in previous centuries, but when the House, and then those days, the House only sat for an handful of hours at a time. But as Parliament's role and independence grew, its hours increased, and the demands on the Speaker grew too. By the time the first formal return of hours in 1834, the House was sitting for an average of 8.4 hours per day, very similar to today. In addition, a significant number of those hours fell after midnight. Those days, in these days, we have four people who can share the burden of cheering across the long parliamentary day. Back then, there was only one. Inevitably, the problems continues and increase and in 1853, a select committee was appointed to consider the matter. The report of the committee hints at the burdens of the office taking their toll on the health of various speakers, which in turn increased the number of days when the speaker would need to be absent for health reasons. The committee also noted that the need to serve the House was forcing speakers from absence far sooner than was advisable for their own well-being. For instance, the report mentions the case of where a speaker would return to work extremely soon after the death of a close relative, which, in the words of the report, involved a greater sacrifice of private feeling than could possibly be expected. It was then clear that something had to be done. The burden was too much for one man to bear, and it was impractical for the business of the House to be dependent on the health of well-being of one man. But there were some strongly held views to overcome. The office of the Speaker, one of the great offices of state, was held in high esteem. And in 1853, the committee was worried about the effect of diluting the authority of the Speaker by allowing another member to chair the House. The committee said, the confidence and the respect of chiefly paid to one man selected by the House for the office cannot be expected to attach easily to another, who may be his substitute for a few days and then sink again into the general body of the House. The committee decided that this could be avoided by, the appointing, by appointing one specific MP as a formal go-to deputy speaker. That is why they recommended that the man should be the Chairman of Ways and Means. Although the Chairman of Ways and Means chaired committed the whole house from the lower chair at the clerk's table, there had previously been no connection between the Chairman of Ways and Means and the upper chair of the house, the domain, the Speaker. But the Chairman of Ways and Means was an obvious person to turn to. As the committee put it, the Chairman of the Committee of Ways and Means is familiar with the proceedings of the House and is accustomed to preside and preserve order in deliberations of committees of the whole House. His designation for this duty will prevent any difference of opinions in the selection of a temporary substitute of Speaker. Following the publication the report, the House agreed that the resolution that is an unavoidable absence of the Speaker, the Chairman of Ways and Means, should take the chair in the House on a day-to-day -day basis. It was soon considered necessary, for the sake of certainty, to put those arrangements on a firmer footing. A standing order was made in 1855, giving the Chairman all of the duties and the authorities of the Speaker in relation to the proceedings of the House. The Deputy Speaker Act of the same year conferred on the Deputy, acting under the standing order, the full power of the Speaker in and out of the House, including powers under statute. I think we've got a photo coming up. The first person to fill this combined role was Henry Fitzroy. There's Henry Fitzroy. The first time that Fitzroy took the Speaker's chair, just after the House had come out of Committee of Ways and Means. So the transition was particularly 
Initially, the arrangements for the Deputy Speaker taking the chair were formal and were intended to cover occasional absences by the Speaker. The Speaker would supply a, a medical certificate to the House saying why he was prevented from attending the House. One slightly embarrassing example of this reveals that he'd sprained his leg mounting his horse. Do we believe that? I think it was more likely he fell out of his carriage on his way back from the club. But over time, procedures were changed to make the whole procedure simpler. From 1888, the House did away with the need to formally announce the absence of the Speaker, allowing the chair to take the chair when requested to do so by Mr Speaker and without any formal communication to the House. Then in 1906, we were changed again to allow the Deputy to take the chair on the basis of an informal request from the Speaker. This paved the way for the flexible system we now we now have, where our rota is an informal document that can chop and change at short notice without question or announcement having been having to be put to the House. Over time, it was decided that further assistance was needed, and the first Deputy Chairman of Ways and Means was appointed in 1902. Eventually, in 1971, the first permanent second Deputy Chairman was appointed. That complemented the Deputy Speaker team. It established the structure we now have. A Speaker, three Deputy Speakers, the Chairman of Ways and Means, the first Deputy Chairman, and the second Deputy Chairman, which is the original titles. So, so I and my two colleagues have a long line of illustrious procedures. But one way in which the current set of Deputy Speakers is very different is that we are the first elected by the whole House. Until 2010, the Chairman of Ways and Means and the Deputy Chairman were appointed. Discussions would happen behind closed doors, between the Leader of the House, the usual channels that we often hear in this great House. The Whips would also involve themselves in this decision. They will weigh up what they considered to be the most suitable of candidates. The Leader of the House will table a motion and appoint certain MPs to the position. The motion was made without notice. The House therefore had little to say who its deputy speakers would be. So why did this long-standing procedure change in 2010? Well, in 2009, Speaker Burko himself the first speaker to be elected by a formal secret ballot announced that he intended to introduce a similar ballot for the election of deputy speakers. He said, in a modern democracy that puts parliament first, I am convinced that the choice of such office holders should be determined not by consultation, but by the process of election. Thank goodness he did. I wouldn't be here today speaking to you. The change was also part of a wider trend towards electing those holding the key House post. For instance, the right reforms in the last Parliament also set out procedures for electing the chairs of departmental select committees. The Procedure Committee consequently examined the issue of how to go about electing the Deputy Speakers and produced reports setting out the procedure for the ballot. The House agreed to the Procedures Committee's recommendations in March 2010, right at the end of the last Parliament, and the stage was set for the first ballot to follow the general election soon afterwards. So I was the first to be elected as the MP for Chorley in 2010. I then decided it was time to do something different. I decided to stand for the role of Deputy Speaker. I've been a backbench MP since 1997. I'd served on the trading industry committee had enjoyed every moment of it. I'd always been a backbencher, but as much as I'd enjoyed it, I thought it was time for change. And I knew that I would not have been appointed to the position, but after several colleagues suggested that I would be suited to the role, I began to consider standing for the election. After all, now the position was elected rather than appointed, there was a good chance that I could break the mould and be the poacher that turns gamekeeper. In the end, nine candidates threw the hat in the ring. The election was held three weeks into the new parliament. The election was secret ballot using a single transferable voting system. Each member voted once, numbering all of the candidates in order of preference. 
There were several rounds of counting. In each round, the lowest ranked member was eliminated and his or her, her votes were reallocated to second preference marked and so, and so on until you went through the ballot paper. The procedures for electing the deputies imposes certain constraints on the composition of the speaker team. speaker team. The first constraint is gender and the second is party. In the terms of gender, the standing order stipulates that at least one of the speaker team, so the speaker and the three deputies, must be a woman and that one must be a man. This has long been a convention when deputy speakers were appointed, but the election of deputies was the first time that it was then set in stone. At the moment, we have an even balance of two men and two women. In the terms of the party, the Chairman of Ways and Means, the lead deputy, must come from the opposite side of the House to that of where the Speaker was drawn. So since Mr Speaker used to be a Conservative MP, and under the current coalition government, only candidates from the opposite side can stand the chance of being elected to the top post of Chairman of Ways and Means. That in order to maintain balance, the first Deputy Chairman of Ways and Means has to come from the same side of the House as the Speaker, so Government side. Finally, to wrap it all up neatly, the second Deputy Chairman has to come from the opposite side of the House to Mr Speaker again. So again, we're looking for a Labour or another opposition MP. And there we are, all smiling. <laughs> Team Burkle at our best. One current setup is me, a Labour MP, Eleanor Lang, the first Deputy Chairman, who is a Conservative MP, and Don Primrolo, the second Deputy Chairman, who is a Labour MP. This leaves us with a neat balance across the House. I, of course, was delighted to be elected a Deputy Speaker. It is a fascinating post and I was touched to receive such support from colleagues right across the House. But after 13 years of being a vocal Labour MP, some, sometimes described as a rebel MP, it did impose a significant change in my political life. Deputy Speakers have to have the confidence of the House. They have to oversee debates in a neutral way, without any outward manifestation of personal interest or opinion. Very hard for MPs, I tell you. For that reason, deputy speakers cannot participate in many of the activities that are the bread and butter of MPs. We cannot make speeches in the House or vote. We cannot table questions or early day motions. And we cannot put our names to amendments or motions. It is, of course, the same for Mr Speaker. But when Mr Speaker is elected, he ceases to be a member of a political party. By convention, he stands unopposed at the general election and stands a Speaker seeking re-election. For us deputies, it's very different. We do not stand down from our political parties. I remain a Labour, M a Labour MP, as does Don Primarola. Eleanor Lang remains a Conservative MP. Don is standing down at the election. I'm sorry that Don is going. But Eleanor and I will both stand for re-election for our respective parties. Both of us find ourselves opposed in our constituencies by the other main political parties. So Deputy Speakers, we have to walk the tightrope. We must be neutral and impartial in the chair, but in our constituencies, we must remain the party animals and campaigning for our parties and working hard on behalf of our constituents. In fact, I think the deputy speakers must be some of the hardest working constituent CMPs because we have to demonstrate to our constituents that our absence from the Westminster political stage in no way diminishes our work for them and on behalf of them. So what do deputy speakers, what do they actually do? Well, the most visible duty, as we all know, is being in the chair in the chamber. Usually each of us will chair for a couple of hours each day, every sitting day. In the chair, we have all the powers of the speaker. We do the routine duties, calling people to speak, imposing time limits if necessary, responding, responding to points of order, calling divisions, and so on and so on. 
we can also do other things. Suspending the House if necessary or naming a disorderly member and having him or her ejected from the chamber. Now all of this asks a great deal of the occupant of the chair. We need several key skills. First we need concentration. The ability to focus on a debate for hours at a time. Often debates are very technical, especially when it comes to amendments to bills. The chair must be on top of the debate at all times, checking that procedures are being followed and making sure that members' speeches aren't wandering outside the scope of the debate. I hope mine isn't at the moment. We also need procedural knowledge. It is the chair that puts the question to the House, bringing debates to a close. And it is the chair who guides the House through complicated sets of questions on amendments and amendments to amendments and sometimes even amendments to amendments to amendments. And of course, the clerks that they're there to advise us on more obscure aspects of the procedure of the House. And I've got to say, the clerks are a great asset to the chair. I do welcome the advice of clerks. But the more we know ourselves, the smoother the proceedings are for the House. But most of all, we need instinct and authority. The House has different moods, and the chair must weigh up those moods and adapt the approach accordingly. Sometimes a firm hand is needed, and others, a little humour needs to be brought, which can always diffuse a very tense moment. Or cajole the House along. It is always about judging the best way to keep the House on track. To give you a sense of that, let me show you some of the interventions I had to make in the course of last year's budget statement. Probably the occasion in the parliamentary calendar when the House is at its rowdiest, certainly it's most excitable, and certainly it is most packed. <laughs> to remind honourable members that it is the norm not to intervene on the chest of the Exchequer or the Leader of the Opposition. I now call the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Right Honourable George Osborne. Yeah. Obviously the country is waiting to hear the Chancellor. I certainly want to hear the Chancellor. I'm sure most of the people in this chamber also want to hear the Chancellor. Please let's hear the Chancellor, George Osborne.
think we're about to start again, and we don't want another repeat. So, as you can see, there's a great deal in the tour, but we also have other deputy speaker duties to do behind the scenes. Most importantly, we attend the daily speakers' conference. This is when the speaker and the deputies and the principal clerks run through the business of the day and discuss any matters of interest. This is a regular daily contact between the speaker team and ensures that no matter who is in the chair, they are aware of the same information and have received the same advice. This means that the speaker team can operate as a single unit and that the House knows it will receive consistent response. We also, as deputies for the Mr Speaker, and at a form, we deputise for Mr Speaker at formal events and where it is always possible where he cannot always attend. And that is a problem for Mr Speaker. He gets so many invites, he has so many difficulties to choose and that's why as deputies we can step in at any moment. It is for that reason that the Speaker was formerly absent from Westminster that I would take his place as Chairman of Ways and Means and would exercise in his place many of the powers that are usually his alone. Such as deciding whether or not to grant urgent questions on the selection of amendments to bills. It is unlikely in the event of both the Speaker and I were absent, in that case the responsibilities would fall in next in line which will be the first Deputy Chairman Eleanor Lang and after her, to Dawn Primarolo, the second Deputy Chair. So there are plenty of duties that come with being Deputy Speaker. But I also have many other duties that are attached not to the post of Deputy Speaker, but to that of the historic post of Chairman of Ways and Means. In fact, the majority of my duties are outside the Chamber, are linked to my post as Chairman of Ways and Means. I don't have time today run, to run through all the duties, but I hope I'm able to give you a flavour of some of them. The most significant additional duty, Chairman of Ways and Means, both historically and currently, is the oversight of private business and private legislation. Very broadly, private legislation is legislation that gives particular powers and benefits to a person or group of people, perhaps an individual or a local authority in addition to or conflict with general law. It is different to public legislation, the bulk of that legislation in Parliament, which applies to the population as a whole. Until the 19th century, private bills mainly concerned the affairs of individuals. For example, private bills were at that time an avenue for securing a divorce. In the 1750 onwards, however, private bills were much more concerned with the construction of toll roads, canals, railways and the like. These days, much of the activity is covered by the Transport and Works Act and private legislation is no longer required. Most modern private bills now concern the granting of additional powers to local authorities and other bodies. The Chairman's private legislation responsibilities predate his appointment as Deputy Speaker. It was in fact the burden of duties that related to private business rather than the need for help with chairing in the Chamber that led to the appointment of the first Deputy Chairman of Ways and Means in 1902. If you imagine the amount of infrastructure that was being built around the end of the 19th century, all the railways, all the waterworks, continuation of some canals, you can see why the private, burden, the private business burden was too great for one person. The Chairman of Ways and Means has a general oversight of private legislation, with the responsibility for examining all private bills in order to draw attention of the House to any problems or concerns. The broad responsibility manifests itself in a wide and complex range of specific duties, far too long to go into today, but which includes the chairing of various committees ruling on certain aspects of procedure and process. Perhaps the most visible part of the role to the casual observer is the private business on the floor of the House, which is always moved formally by myself or one of my deputies rather than a whip or minister. The number of private hybrid bills have reduced significantly in the second half of the 20th century and the private bill duties no longer take up such a proportion of the office time. So by myself and the clerk are not totally reliant on all the acts that used to come forward. But it is still 
a part of the parliamentary's work and the responsibility that I take very seriously. And every now and then some extremely significant issues pop up under private legislation, not more so than the High Speed 2 Bill, which is currently making its way through Parliament. It is a hybrid bill, subject to private business standing orders. So these are far from being trivial matters. Another of my responsibilities is the oversight of committees of the whole House. I spoke earlier about the committees of the whole House for the ways and supply. Although those particular committees no longer exist, the House does still meet in committee on occasion as part of the legislative process. Most bills have their committee stage in the Public Bill Committee upon the committee corridor. Some bills have the committee stage on the floor of the House. This usually occurs in two cases. The first very short bills are emergency bills being taken through the House in a single day. The advantage of a committee of the whole House is the case that there is no delay to the bill's proceedings. The bill can move smoothly from the second reading to committee and back to third reading. The other case is for significant controversial bills, often a bill making a constitutional change. The advantage in this case is that, unlike a public bill committee, where only the members of the nominated committee can participate, in a committee of the whole House, the members of the House can speak and vote, as we mentioned earlier. This is especially important for those big and sensitive bills. In the case of the Finance Bill, that arises from the budget resolutions, the bill is split into two. The most significant and the controversial of its clauses are considered on the floor of the House. And the more routine matters are considered upstairs on the bill committee. My own oversight of committees of the whole House manifests itself in two main duties. First, it is the Chairman of Ways and Means and not the Speaker who selects the group of amendments for consideration in committee the whole house and the second the speaker may not take the chair of the committee of the whole house so it falls to me and the deputies but I can also choose to appoint members of the panel the panel of chairs to take chair of the committee of the whole house is something I try to do as much as possible as it is great experience and I believe a great reward for the duties that they've been carrying out which brings me the panel of chairs themselves, another of my responsibilities. There are simply too many sittings of the House, it's committees for the Speaker and the Deputies to chair everything. It is for this reason we have a body called the panel of chairs, a few dozen members of the House who chair many of the House's other proceedings. I mentioned that the panel members occasionally have the opportunity to chair in the Chamber. That is true, but only comes, as I say, very rarely. Much more of their time is spent during proceedings in the House of the Second Chamber, which is Westminster Hall. And in general committees, the many committees that meet each week to consider bills, delegated legislation and European documents. The panel is appointed by Mr Speaker from those members who volunteer their services. We appoint a party balance of members so that the composition of the panel broadly reflects that of the House. Membership of the panel is an excellent opportunity, especially for those members of the House who have decided not to pursue a front bench career. It also allows members to engage with ranges of the House proceedings and develop those all important chairing skills that I outlined earlier. Although it is not the route that I took, it is a useful training ground for those who may nurture dreams of being a speaker, a deputy speaker themselves someday. As Chairman of Ways and Means, I have oversight of the panel's activities. It is my office that arrange who will chair what session and prepare all the rotors that I share the information with them about the procedures, keeping them informed of all the developments they need to be effective in the chair. At the same time, they feed back to me, letting me know of any problems in committee or any procedural uncertainties or difficulties where my advice or intervention might be required. It is an extremely useful network, both for keeping the Speaker and the Deputies plugged in to what is happening in committees, and for making sure that the authority of the Chair is consistent and respected throughout the House. 
whether from the height of the Speaker's chair down to the most simple delegated legislative committee. Finally, I would like to mention what I find one of my most enjoyable duties. As Chairman of Ways and Means, I am responsible for drawing the names in the ballot of private members. I'm probably the most popular when the names go into the hat, and probably the most unpopular by the time they come out. Early in each new session of Parliament, all backbench members can enter a ballot to be among the privileged handful of private members' bills that will get priority and the time on the floor of the House. These plum time slots are where the bill will stand the most chance of getting through the House and onto the statute book. And the hundreds of members who enter the ballot, all in the hope of being drawn in that top spot. My role is to draw the top 20 names in the hat. Last year we shoot things up a little bit and we drew the names in reverse order. This made the whole process much more tense and exciting both for those watching and for those hoping that their names would be drawn next. We now have a short video of last year's proceedings just to show you what it looks like. So Alan Beal. Number five. 24. That virus, excitement and attention growing. Number four. the clerk's a very serious chap. We'll be holding the next ballot in the week after the state opening, so then when we'll find out who'll be following the footsteps of James Wharton, James Wharton and his European, Euro European referendum bill, last year's ballot winner. The ballot is open to the public, so I urge any of you who are interested in coming along to watch, it really is one of those most quirky parliamentary occasions that still takes place. So you'll see, there are a great many duties that still rest with the post of Chairman of Ways and Means. And that is why the title of Chairman of Ways and Means still endures, even though the Ways and Means Committee no longer exists. I and my two Deputy Chairs are much more simply than Deputy Speakers, even if our time in the Chamber is by far the most visible of our work. That is why I'm so pleased that you've come along today to learn more about somewhat obscure but vitally important post which I have the privilege and hold. I hope that you've been able to, or I have been able to cast some light to you on both how the role came into being and what it means to be the Chairman of Ways and Means in a modern day and age. I also hope that you will all tune into the budget statement on Wednesday to see the Ways and Means in action and that when you see me in the chair, you will appreciate that it is much more than a deputy speaker being given his day in the sun. Although there is certainly no longer a need to keep the elected speaker of the House away from tax and finance debates, and there hasn't been for a long time, the presence of the Chairman of Ways and Means in the Chair on Budget Day is an important reminder to us all of the measures that once had to be undertaken by the House of Commons to first assert and then to secure its rights and independence. I am proud that it falls to me to continue this tradition. I am very much looking forward to taking the chair on Wednesday afternoon. I would like to thank you all for coming today 
and I will be obviously delighted. I will try and answer any questions that you may have on me. But can I say once again, thank you for giving me the time and your patience. Thank you very much.